Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. I'm Tim, and today we're talking about isolated DC to DC converters. So, isolated, what are we referring to when we say isolated? Well, really, we mean we're going to use transformers. And transformers are like the the last component that we haven't really talked about, the last main component we haven't really talked about yet. So we talked about inductors, capacitors, switches, all that stuff, and now we're on to these guys, right? Got some turns, some dots. And why might we, we use a transformer? Well, there's kind of two reasons. One, primary one is probably isolation. Sometimes we want to isolate, electrically isolate, circuits, right? So this transformer prevents, you know, DC stuff on this side from affecting DC stuff on this side. And sometimes that's really useful. The second thing is maybe we want to utilize the gain that is afforded by transformers. So transformers are really good at converting, you know, really high voltage things to really low voltage things and vice versa. And that can be very useful, right? Sometimes we need to create you know, a kilovolt out of a voltage source that is maybe only a couple of volts or something, right? That transformer might be a little odd, but you could do that. So these are the two main reasons we might want to use transformers, and transformers are used literally everywhere in power electronics. So your anything you plug into the wall typically has some kind of isolation in it because there are some safety standards associated with electronics connected to high voltage systems or higher voltage systems. I believe the maximum voltage you can be you can be exposed to is something like 48 volts or 50 volts or something and beyond that you need some kind of galvanic isolation between you and that voltage. So the question that logically arises from this is how do we use these transformers in DC to DC converters? Because typically with transformers, we can only, you know, use them with things that have time varying components, right? So how do we use this thing, which is inherently AC, to a DC application? To do that, we have to look at construction. And from the construction and some equations, we can figure out how we can do this. So, let's look at how transformers are constructed. And we're going to use a very, very simple example. So, typically there's some kind of core. You have some kind of core material, right? Could be iron, steel, ferrite, ferromagnetic materials in general, right? So we have some kind of core. And this core has some specific geometric dimensions, right? This huge part of transformer design is physically how is it, con or what are the dimensions of, of this of this system, right? So there's some cross-sectional area of the core. There is some overall length, you could, we say the average length of this core, which I'll call L. The material itself has some permeability, mu, which we could say is mu r times mu naught. And there's also some windings, right? So maybe we have a winding. Uh, well, I'm going to get the direction correct. So we're going to have a winding this way. Right, the direction totally matters. So we have this winding on one side, the primary side, we'll say. And then we also have a... Uh, a winding on the secondary side, right? And that's typically how we refer to these things, the primary side and the secondary side. You can have multi-winding transformers, right? Transformers with many windings on them. That's totally cool. And these windings have specific properties, right? Notably, they have, well, one, the area that these windings occupy is the area, the cross-sectional area of this core. And it also has a number of turns. We'll say on the primary side, there are N1 turns. On the secondary side, there are N2 turns. And then we define some voltages, right, and currents. So maybe over here we have V1, over here we have V2, and we have some current flowing in, I1, and some current flowing out, I2. And 
This is how I'm going to refer to it. One current's going to flow in, one current's going to flow out. You can think of it in other ways. That's totally fine. You can define them both to be going in. Totally fine. I'm going to consider a transformer as carrying power from one side to the other. And that's why I've defined the current and voltage in this way. Inherently, maybe not inherently, but the way I think about it anyways, is that transformers are electromagnetic transducers. Right? They convert electrical signals, IV, they convert V and I into some magnetic domain variables, notably, namely magnetic flux density B and the magnetic field H, right? And then they convert them back. And in this, when you convert it back to the electric domain, to back to V and I, then you have like the choice of how you want to redistribute that energy between V and I, right? So by choosing the windings, basically, you can choose this relation. And we're going to see how that's done. So how do we do that? Well, we have two equations, basically. We have Ampere's law, right? This is kind of what you expect, which talks about, you know, the, the loop integral of H over L being equal to well, the current contained in that loop. So the, the loop that we're going to consider is this loop. We're going to consider the loop around the core, right? And so the current in this loop, the current contained in this loop is actually two currents. One current is this I1 current a few times, right? It actually multiplies by the number of windings. So it's N1 times I1. And we have the second current, which is going to be a minus sign because it's flowing in the opposite direction, we'll say, n2 times i2. Right, so this is one relation we have. The second relation we have is Faraday's law. Right, and actually the way, what I'm going to refer to as Faraday's law is the EMF representation. So the voltage, the EMF produced by a varying magnetic field or varying flux is equal to minus Lenz's law n d5 by dt, right? So this is the flux contained in this core, right? So I'll, uh, we can imagine that there is some flux flowing in this core. And I've drawn it the opposite way, unfortunately. So the, the flux is actually flowing in this way. Let's uh, just go back a bit. So the flux flows in this direction. It really doesn't matter. I could define it whichever way, but the flux is flowing in this direction and it's phi, right? That's the flux in this core. So we have these two equations. First, let's look at Faraday's law. So so what do we have? Well, it says that V equals minus N d phi dt. There is one flux. So far, we've only assumed that there's one flux flowing in this core. So that flux is flowing both through the primary windings and the secondary windings. So we can say, we can find a relation between V1 and V2, right? So V1 must be equal to minus N1 d5 by dt. And V2 must be equal to minus N2 by that same flux d5 by dt. So there's an assumption here. We're assuming something here. We're assuming all the flux is in the core. It's in the core. Right? And if we do that, if we make this assumption, then what we end up getting is that if we just divide these two equations, equations we get V1 over V2 is equal to N1 over N2. And this is the classic you know, transformer equation that, that we know, right? The ratio of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the of the turns ratios. And again, this assumes that the flux is time varying, right? So that means that this these voltages are also time varying, right? That is an inherent assumption in here. However, what happens if all the flux is not contained in the core? Right? What happens then? So maybe some flux 
maybe there's some flux that's, you know, flowing outside of the core on both sides, right? What happens then? Well, we can modify this equation, right? We can modify it by considering that there's going to be some extra flux. So maybe I'll call this phi 1 dt, some extra flux on the secondary side, which I'll call maybe phi 2 dt, right? This is the flux not flowing in the core. Or some leakage flux. Okay, so what happens if we don't assume that all, all the flux is in the core? Well, basically, we have these extra terms, right? We have this d phi 1 and d phi 2, and it's going to affect the equations, right? So the relation that we end up getting is that v1 is going to be equal to, well, we have the, the regular part. We have the n1 over n2 v2. Then we have some extra stuff, right? Well, namely, first of all, we have this n1 or minus n1 d phi 1 by dt, and then we have some some this extra term from the secondary side, which we'll say is plus n1 d phi 2 by dt, right? So this has kind of ruined our perfect equation, right? Typically what we say is that we model this as leakage inductance. So instead of modifying, you know, our, our transformer equations, what we do is we add an extra element to our transformer model and then keep the ideal model. So we keep this part, but we just note that the V1 were actually the V1 and V2 were we're talking about is only focused on the that ideal transformer. So what, what we end up doing basically is we have our ideal transformer, right, with dots and one and two, and then we add some leakage inductance on the primary and secondary side. So L leakage one, L leakage two, right? And so the V1 and V2 we end up considering, so right now this is the V1 and this is the V2, but when we're doing the ideal turns ratio, if we consider this say V1 prime and this V2 prime, then this ideal turns ratio holds again. But basically when not all the flux is contained, then we have to include these leakage inductances. So that's one non-ideality that we have to consider. And then we have some more, another non-ideality, right? So let's look at Ampere's law now. So what does Ampere's law say? Well, it says that the contour integral of the magnetic field dotted with dl, not ld, dl, some differential length, is equal to the contained current. So we have n1 times i1 minus n2 times i2, right? And again, the loop we're considering is the loop in the core, right? The, the closed loop of the core itself, this loop here. So here we're also going to make some assumptions, right? So what we're going to assume is that the magnetic field is aligned with this differential length everywhere, right? So the, the, the dot product here just ends up being one. Simplifying this integral into simply, we'll just say H times L. And that's equal to n1 i1 minus n2 i2. Mm -hmm. So we have some more relations actually to consider, right? Namely the relation of the material itself. So some material relation between B and H, right? And that's usually described as B equals mu H, where there's some magnetic permeability of the material itself, which re relates the magnetic field to the magnetic flux density B. So we can rearrange this, right? We can say that H is actually equal to B over mu. Now, why do we want to do this? Because we want to relate this to flux again, right? So in this previous equation, we were thinking about the time varying flux in the core, right? We also want to consider this time varying flux again, right? So how do we get the flux? Well, we know that the flux, and this is why Faraday's law is important or why we think about it before, the flux is actually equal to the surface integral of B times some differential area dA. All right, so this is the flux in the core. It's the surface integral of B dot dA. And again, if we assume that the flux density is always perpendicular or really aligned with the, it's, it's aligned with the normal of the, of the area, of this differential area, right? Then what we get is that the flux is equal to B times A. Right, so this cross-sectional area. So we're bringing in these dimensional 
these geometric properties of the material of the material itself. Right? So we have h equals b over mu, which means that h is equal to, well, again, if we simplify this, we get, sorry, we get b is equal to the flux phi over a. And if we sub this back in here, what we get is that h is equal to the flux times 1 over mu a. Cool. Okay, so how does this help us? Well, we sub this expression back into here, right? So what do we get? We get phi, the flux, times L over mu a is equal to n1 i1 minus n2 i2. So usually for ideal transformers, we make the assumption that the core material is ideal. What this means is that one, so some ideal assumptions, ideal assumptions. One, mu r, the relative permeability is infinite, let's say. And two, the material does not experience saturation. So if we apply this, this one, right, this mu r is infinite, to this, then what we end up getting, what we end up getting is that zero is equal to n1 i1 minus n2 i2, which is our standard relation. i1 over i2 is equal to n2 over n1, right, for a transformer. This is what we expect, and it's due to this specific uh, consideration. However, if we don't consider mu r to be infinite, Maybe more specifically, if we think about the fact that core materials exhibit this hysteresis and saturation effect, right? Usually this is what we this is how we draw the relation between B and H in a material, right? We have H, we have B. There are two things going on here. One, the core saturates. If you put too much uh, field inside this core material, then the flux will saturate. You won't be able to get any more flux in that flux density in that core, which means the flux the time varying flux will no longer time vary, which means you no longer couple the primary side to the secondary side, right? And secondly, mu r, which is related to the slope, is not infinite. It's finite, right? There's some specific relation. So this, this saturation effect is really what we're going to toss out. So what happens if we do that? Well, we see it right here. If mu r not infinite or no saturation, or, I mean, there is saturation, slash saturation exists, then there is a discrepancy between n1 and n2, and it's this term right here. So then we get phi times L over mu A is the difference between n1 i1 minus n2 i2, right? It's the difference between these two things. So this is like some energy stored. This relates to some energy stored in the core. Typically, we don't want to do this. Typic ideal transformers do not store any, any energy, except flyback transformers. We'll get there. We don't want to do this. And if we store too much energy, right, if we put too much energy into this core, then we end up getting some saturation, which stops the coupling from the primary side to the secondary side. So we model this. This energy storage of the non-ideal material the non-ideal material as a magnetizing inductance, as a magnetizing inductance. And this is like the most important thing to consider, right? So what do we have? Now we have, including this leakage inductance and the magnetizing inductance, our model turns into, into this. We have the leakage, we have the magnetizing, we have our ideal transformer inside our regular transformer, right, which has all the properties we want, n1 to n2, some dots. I'll call this L mag, L leakage 1, L leakage 2. Right, so this whole thing is our non-ideal 
transformer. And inside of it, we have this ideal transformer. So what am I saying? We can couple energy from the primary side to the secondary side as long as we don't saturate the core. In this case, in this electrical, this electric circuit diagram, saturating the core means that the current in the magnetizing inductance goes above some maximum current. So what this means is that we need the magnetizing current, I mag, to be less than some saturation current, I sat. If we do this, then we're good. How do we do this? Well, we just have to ensure that the current through this inductor, this L mag, stays below a certain value. What is the current in the inductor? So we know VL mag is equal to L mag, the magnetizing inductance, times DIL mag, the current flowing through the magnetizing inductance by DT, right? This is just a trend, the, uh, the inductor equation, right? And if we integrate both sides, what do we get? We get the integral of VL mag by DT is equal to do 1 over L mag over here is equal to I mag. So what this is saying, if we keep the volt seconds right, this is the exact same thing as IVSB, if we keep the volt seconds below a certain value, and balance them, right? If we do if we balance it over a cycle, right, re relating this back to switch mode power supplies over a switching cycle, then I mag will we can ensure that I mag is less than I sat. Right? Just by basically doing IVSB on the magnet magnetizing inductance. So we have to ensure IVSB on L mag, and we could say that we keep the absolute value of VDT less than some max. Right, so we just can't let it be too big. And if you want to think about the current, the magnetizing current. Then we have some maximum, we could say ISAT, and some minimum, maybe minus ISAT. And as long as we keep this, this magnetizing current inside this range, then we don't saturate the core and we're totally fine. Right? Then, then we can couple the primary side to the secondary side. How we do that is a little bit challenging, but basically the, the idea so if we if we do all this stuff, then we're good. How do we do this? Well, what we're going to do pretty simply is we'll have some voltage source. And we'll have our, our transformer, our non-ideal transformer. And there are more not, more non-idealities. Capacitive coupling that can happen. There is uh, resistance of the of the leads, etc. So we have our non-ideal transformer with the leakage, all this good stuff, and we have our DC load, right? So what we're going to do, pretty simply, is we're going to convert this DC voltage into an AC voltage somehow, and then on the secondary side. We're going to convert that, whatever this AC voltage that we have, back to a DC. And th this is how the 
a lot of converters are, are, are constructed, actually. This is the basic idea. We have a DC source. We convert it to AC somehow. We use a transformer to, you know, do an electromagnetic transconduction, you could say. And then we reconvert that produced AC voltage or current in, into a DC voltage or current, right? And that would be our output. And that is how we construct DC to DC converters using transformers. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of lectures. We're going to derive a few converters and uh, look in depth at, at how they work. Cool. Thank you.